Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 49 of the weekly playback. I am super excited for today's episode. I played a lot of games in the last week. I might skip one or two of them actually um, in this week's discussion and maybe save them for next week. Um, they're games I've talked about anyway and they're not like new, they're like pretty old games. But the one that I'm most excited about this week is Dreadful Meadows. So this finally arrived. So this is a pre-production copy of a game that is hitting Kickstarter next month just in time for Halloween. So Dreadful Meadows is for one to four players and it's designed by Lucas Adam and the artist is Paul Tobin and the publisher is Arcus Games. Um, and the like the underneath the title it says creepy confectioners compete to be this season's sweetest supplier so in this game you it's a farming game actually um so you are farming and harvesting candy so i played i received this on thursday i think and i just could not wait to play it so i played a two-player game of this no did i receive it on thursday no i received it on wednesday because yesterday was thursday and then last night i played a two-player game of this and i'm just so freaking excited about this game like I really really enjoyed it. So here is the main board and you are going to have different patch tiles here up here actually and you'll have candy components where the candy components are listed. So each player is going to have a board. Now it's listed as a one to four player game but there are five different boards. So there is Luna and I played as Luna and each player has their own special ability. So Luna and as I start to explain the game you'll understand what their special abilities do more and more but Luna treats patches as any chosen type when, re when retrieving sprites. So I'll explain what that means and I played as Luna when I played last night. Igor, he generates candy on patches where he places sprites and where harvesters are activated and I'll explain how that will work in a minute. Nina, gain the corresponding sprite bonus of the first patch you place after purchasing. Then there is Leaf. Leaf, you may place sprites onto patches containing other sprites, which is something you typically, typically cannot do, and I'll explain what sprites are in a minute. And then Jack, ignore all market costs when purchasing patches, which is really nice because when you're purchasing patches, you will have the cost of the patch itself, and then underneath there might be an up cost, if that's what the correct terminology is, up cost, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so in this game, um, and you also have these really cool harvesters, which are these nice acrylic pieces pieces um, so it comes with 13 of them which you'll need you know you'll need all 13 if you're playing a four player game and then this bag has the various patches in it and so let me just show you some examples so here are some gummy globs here are some phantom mallows here are some here's a dreadful tree uh, let me get an orange and a pink one out do, 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 if I can actually get to an orange and a pink one. Okay, here's uh, triacle teeth and then here is the pumpkin patch, pumpkin pops. So, and then you have all these amazing candy pieces which were placed on the board and then um, I think I'm missing some, oh yeah, here. So five different types of candy, and then you have your sprites. So each player has these sprites, which go on their own player board. So you place them here. So, and then of course we have these cards, which you are fulfilling. So you have these concoction cards. So you are trying to grow candy and fulfill these cards in order to get points. And you also get points from patches and harvesters, and I'll get to that in a minute. So like here are some examples of concoction cards. So there's a variety of cards and each player starts with a three pointer, a six pointer, and a nine pointer card. So you need the various candy that is shown on the card in order to fulfill these concoction cards. And of course I went ahead and sleeved them because as people might know already, I am obsessed with Halloween. So as soon as I got this, I was like, yes, I am going to sleeve these cards and preserve this game because I'm just so freaking excited about this game. So on your turn, so each person will start with a dreadful tree patch as well as a 
patch of the one that goes with their own character. So if you have Jack, you are going to start with the pumpkin pop patch as well as a candy that goes with the pumpkin pot, pop and the dreadful tree. And you will also, um, yeah, and you start with your sprites on your board. So when you are placing patches, you want to try to place them next to their own color but also next to this dreadful tree because the dreadful tree is actually a wild patch and at the end of the game you're going to score for your clusters only if you have a harvester on them and i'll get to that in a minute so you want to and the dreadful tree can count as a part of multiple clusters so what i did in my game and i will you know throw up a picture um I had my dreadful tree like in the center and then I had my clusters coming off of it of the different kinds. So I had like a pink here and then like a blue up here and then I had my clusters coming out of the dreadful tree so that it would count as a part of each cluster because you can do that. So on your turn you can take one of the following actions. You can purchase a patch from this board with the candy that you have and you can only use candy that is currently on your patches. So if you've started placing candy on a concoction card you cannot take off that candy and then use it to purchase something so again the purchase price of a patch will be what is listed on the patch itself then any um like additional cost that is listed below it and once you purchase something they slide down and you refill the board of course so you can purchase a patch, you can place a sugar sprite onto a patch which generates candy. So when you place a sugar sprite onto a patch, it's going to generate a piece of candy on each adjacent patch to that patch. And adjacent means it's sharing a side. So it cannot be sharing a corner. Like these two are not adjacent, but these are adjacent. So if you place a sugar sprite on the dreadful tree, you would generate a patch on this marshmallow, uh, ghost phantom mallow uh, patch. Um, and of course, at that point in time, you can choose to keep the candy there or move it to a concoction card. You will not be generating candy on patches that already have candy. So if you then subsequently placed another sugar spray on a patch which was already adjacent to a patch that already generated candy, you're not going to generate an additional piece of candy on that patch. Um, the other action you can take is to purchase a harvester. So harvesters are you want to purchase these because they will help you score more points and generate more candy. So harvesters can only be placed on patches that are completely surrounded on four sides. And to purchase a harvester, you are going to pay the, so you'll look at all the adjacent tiles, add up their values, and that's how much you have to pay for a harvester. So if you are trying to place a harvester on a tile that is surrounded by, let's say four of these, four times four because there's four of these would be 16 so you would need to pay 16 in value to get this harvester and place it um, harvesters themselves don't generate candy they need to work in conjunction with sprites so i'll explain that in a minute um, but let me just talk about the value of candy the value of candy is worth the patch that it grows on so for example triacle teeth will be worth three dollars pumpkin pops are worth four dollars each these dreadful trees which are wilds and they can be used as one resource of any other kind when fulfilling a concoction card but for buying they are worth five dollars um, these gummy pops are one dollar each and i think i covered all of them i did yeah i think that's all of them so those are the values of the different candy so finally the last action you can do is to retrieve sugar sprites. So if you've previously placed a sugar sprite to generate candy, when you retrieve that sugar sprite, depending on which tile you retrieved it from, which patch you retrieved it from, you'll get a bonus. So if you retrieve it from a pumpkin pop, you can place a sugar sprite from your supply onto a different patch. If you retrieved it from a phantom malo, you can generate two candies on this patch immediately. If you retrieved it from a gummy, um, you can uh, gain one candy of your choice for a concoction card. If you retrieved it from a triacle teeth, you can draw a random patch from the bag and place it immediately, which I think is like really cool. And then finally, if you retrieve it from the tree, if I can just find a tree again here, which I don't think I can, I don't know where I put them. Where'd you go trees? Well, anyway, if you retrieve it from a tree, 
you can draw one concoction card from the draw pile. So that these will be in a draw pile and you'll be able to draw an additional concoction card for you to fill. So those are the basic actions and you can take one action per, year ter per turn. So four different basic actions and at any time during your turn, you can fill concoction cards. And then retrieving sprites, you know what the bonuses are. So when I was playing as Luna, my special ability was when I retrieved a sprite, I could treat it as any patches that I wanted to, which I thought was really cool. My opponent um, played as, um, he played as the pumpkin. So he was able to ignore the cost on the board when purchasing patches and he only had to pay the cost of the patch itself. So, you know, so far we've only played with two of these characters, but the game was very close in the end. So, you know, balancing wise, it, I didn't see any issues there. So in the end, I won with 40 points and my opponent had 38 points. Um, so what you want to do, so let's talk about scoring because that's the important part. So at the end of the game, scoring, so there's different ways to trigger game end. And of course, depending on player count, you're going to have a different amount of patches in the bag for the supply. You're going to have um, a certain number of these harvesters available. So in a two player game, you only have seven harvesters available. So again, you know, the number will vary depending on player count. So the final round is triggered when there is either, when either there is only one harvester remaining or the bag is emptied of patches, or if all concoction cards have been drawn from the draw pile, which I don't think that would ever happen. Like there's just so many cards, I cannot see game men being triggered that way, unless you play with like a really higher player count then possibly. Um, but there's just a lot of concoction cards and I feel like, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, generating points in this game, you can really focus on your your patches or you can focus on these cards or both, I guess. But I feel like there's ways to score high, high points in both ways. Um, so the how you score your you know completed concoction cards are worth the points that are indicated on them so three six or nine then each harvester will score victory points equal to the value of its patch so if you had a harvester on a five value patch that harvester alone is worth five points then each patch without a harvester harvester scores one victory point for each harvester within its cluster. So again, remember a cluster is going to be patches of the same color, including dreadful trees that are together. So if you have like say three of these together plus a dreadful tree, um, you know, that's a cluster. So you are going to score each patch that doesn't have a harvester on it as one point for each harvester in its cluster. So if you have two harvesters in a cluster, then each patch within that cluster will be worth two points. So my opponent, he had one cluster that in fact had two harvesters in it, and he might have been able to add a third. So when the game end is triggered, at first I was like, okay, well, this is weird because the game end is triggered when there's one harvester remaining, so I had bought the like the second to last harvester said that there was only one remaining. So since I was the um, the one who triggered the game end, my, the opponent, he had one other final turn. So he could have bought that final harvester. And for a second, I was like, well, what's the point of that? Because, you know, you are not going to be able to generate candy with that harvester. Oh, and I'll go back to how harvesters work in a minute. Um, but harvesters are worth points and they help your patches to be worth points as well. So that's why. So how harvesters work during the game, which I forgot to talk about. <laughs> so when you have a harvester on a patch, and you have a sprite on an adjacent, like, so you have adjacent patches, right? I'll throw up an image. And so let's suppose you put a sprite on this patch. It's going to trigger any harvesters that are adjacent to it to generate candy adjacent to them. So you're basically going to be able to generate more candy because of harvesters. But again, they work in conjunction with sprites, but they're worth points at the end of the game. So that is essentially the game. It's like a farming game. You are generating candy and using that candy to fill concoction cards and buy more patches or buy harvesters. So yeah, it's a pretty cool game and I really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, so like I'll just talk about the, you know, my and my opponent's score sheet. So completed concoctions, I had 18 points in concoctions, he had 12. For harvesters, I had eight points worth of harvesters because again, they're worth the uh, amount of points of the patch that they're on. So if your patch is worth five points, the harvester will be worth five points. Uh, gummy glob clusters, I had four points. 
he had seven. Then Fontamalo clusters. I didn't have a harvester on my Fontamalo cluster, so I couldn't score my Fontamalo patches. So you have to have a harvester in order to score patches. So I had zero for that, but he had 16 points, which was really good. Then triacle teeth cluster, I had five and he had zero. Then pumpkin pop clusters, I had three and he had zero. And then remaining candy for every five, I believe it's for every five of remaining candy. If every five dollars worth of remaining candy, you'll score one victory point and we both got zero for that. So that is Dreadful Meadows. So yeah, it's a really delightful farming game. Like I really love it. And as someone who is obsessed with Halloween I was like looking for like a quintessential Halloween game and this is it for me like I really wanted like a medium weight Halloween game that I could play with you know friends on Halloween that isn't like you know social deduction like you know the werewolf games or something like that so I'm glad that there is like finally a Halloween game that I am super excited about like the artwork everything about this is great the components and this is pre-production copy but the components components are absolutely fantastic. The candy is amazing. Oh, let me just show you the difference in some of the candy because it's really cool. Like some of the candy is smooth while some of them have ridges which is really cool. Like these trees, I don't know if you can see that, have like these ridges on them but this one, the pumpkins are like smooth. But of course they're screen printed on both sides. The candy is amazing. You know, patches, good quality. Everything about this, I absolutely love it. Like, I seriously, seriously love it. Of course, you know, I would think I was predisposed to loving this game because I'm such a huge Halloween fan. Um, but yeah, but it's a re it is actually a good game. So, so yeah, I'm super excited about this. Um, love the artwork, love everything. So I'm really glad to have this in my possession and I will be making a one minute video for it as well. But I'm glad that I got to give you a first look at this game. And again, it will be hitting Kickstarter in October. So definitely keep your eyes out for this game. So yeah, let me just put away the stuff and then we will go on to the next game. So yeah, if you um, have had a chance to like maybe look at some photographs of this game, tell me what your favorite piece of candy is in this game. I do think mine, I think mine, gosh, it's really between the pumpkins and the trees. I really like both of them, I think. I think those are my favorites. All right, and I think I already showed you, but the bag is also, you know, printed, which is really nice. It says Sinister Seeds on it. Hybrid MMO. Oh, that's cool. And then it says 80 pounds. Supernaturally good candy crops. That is really cool. Like the attention to detail that they try to make it look like a real seed bag. That is really nice. I like that. So yeah. So that is Dreadful Meadows. I am going to try to play it and I know I say this all the time but I really mean it. I'm going to try to play it solo and at a higher player account because I really want to see how this plays at a higher player account. Um, especially as someone who is obsessed with Halloween and definitely wants to play this a lot more next month leading up to Halloween. So yeah, really cool artwork. I just want to show you the artwork on the box again. Like, isn't that so freaking nice? Just love that. Just really, really love it. Uh, actually, as some of you might know, um, I'm like trying to design my own Halloween game, but it's nothing like this. So that's good. <laughs> so yeah. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -bum. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Sorry, almost done. Maybe at this point you guys can just skip ahead because I always leave timestamps. So if you don't want to see me cleaning up a game, you can just click on the timestamp to go to the next game. <laughs> but I am almost done. Today is September 30th, in fact, so tomorrow is the first day of October. So super excited that it is Halloween month, finally. All right. Oh, and I'll just show you the box because everything does. Why do I always leave one card out behind? Okay, so let me just show you the box because everything does fit nicely. Even the um, harvesters fully assembled fit nicely into the box, which is great. Um, so let me just show you. So yeah, so 
It's a nice deep box and then I just, you know, can throw all the candy on top. And of course I individually bag them because in this case, you know, you do keep the candy separate on the board in their own designated candy areas. So in this case, I think it actually pays to be an overbagger like me because that will make it easier to set up and clean up at the end because if you have it all in one giant bag, you're going to have to separate out all the candy. So in this case, I think it makes sense to have them all in separate bags. So yeah, so that was Dreadful Meadows and I just love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Here's the box again, because I just, I just really love it. Anyway, I'm just gonna put it back here because that's where I had it since it's Halloween time. I'm just gonna have it there behind me. Alrighty, um, let's talk about, so the next game I'll talk about is a game that I've been saying I would talk about, but finally I will talk about it. <laughs> it's Heist and Hyperspace, Hyperspace. I keep on saying Hyper instead of Hyper and I don't know why. So this game is also hitting Kickstarter next month. Um, this box is of course a production, uh, uh, prototype copy so you know this is just a, like a small like you know prototype box but it's obviously going to be much nicer in the production copy and a lot of these are prototype components so they're going to still be subject to change and I already know that they're planning on changing some of the components like the tokens and such so this is described as a um, space exploration game I'm not sure what kind of mechanics this you know I don't, I don't know what the name for this mechanic is. So I'll, actually I didn't, I don't have to, I didn't take a picture of when I played it, but you'll see my video soon. But you're going to have five columns of cards. And in this game, you will always go to the column to the left and each player is going to place their meeple on a card on that column and then get the resources from that card and then perform the action on that card. And you're trying to get resources because there's going to be treasure cards that you are trying to steal. And you need to get those treasure cards in order to get renown and then whoever has the most renown at the end of the game will win so I don't so you know I think it's like turn order kind of thing because whoever has the meeple at the top of that column and you can go to any card in that column they will be the first one to place in the next column in the next round so each column of cards is, is essentially a round in the game and there's three expeditions with five rounds each so five columns and you're going to refill all the columns after each expedition after the first two expeditions um so I don't know what mechanic that is like do you guys know what that's actually called is it just turn order like where you just go to a card get the resources do the action and then where you are in that column determines who goes next I'm not sure what that is called exactly but that's essentially the game so you are trying to just gather resources and perform actions and actions can be something like um, you know getting other resources but you can also hire mercenaries when you get to certain columns there are mercenaries which will allow you better abilities that you can use to try to, you know, gather more resources and perform these heists. And in addition to that, each person has their own captain card and you have a special ability that you can use once per expedition. And again, each expedition has five rounds in it. So I'll just show you some of the captain cards. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And again, prototype version. So keep that in mind. So if you use your special ability, you will exhaust your card until the next expedition. But yeah, that is essentially the game. Um, and you know, so the cards have cool artwork on them. There's a bunch of different cards with lots of different artwork. There's like treasure cards, these vault cards. So let me just show you an example of a card where you might go to explore. So like the acid pit, for example. So, you know, and then it lists what your, you know, resources are that you can get, plus the actions you can take and so on. Like this rotating puzzle kind of reminds me like the artwork and stuff kind of reminds me of the tv show squid game i don't know if you guys ever saw it it's like a korean tv show so yeah it actually for some reason really reminds me of that i don't know why <laughs> maybe because like you're you know you're trying to perform these like heists and stuff and the artwork is like very kind of like sci-fi and just like kind of like futuristic and not that sci uh, squid game was like really futuristic but i don't know it just really gives me squid game vibes for some reason so yeah heist in hyperspace is a good game you know i i personally don't think it's anything extraordinary. I haven't played another game like this before though. So I haven't, not to my recollection, have I played a game where you are just 
placing your meeples on cards within a certain column and then that's determining the turn order of the next column. I cannot recall if I've ever played a game like that before but it's a good game. It's a solid game um, so if you like the theme and if you like the artwork then I would recommend it and if you're looking for a sp space exploration game that has like that kind of turn order thing then sure I would recommend this game. So yeah it's you know it's a good game so that's heist in hyperspace. So the next game and that's also coming to Kickstarter later this month. The next game I will talk about is... Do, 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 do. Let's talk about Get On Board. So I really wanted this game, so I finally got a copy of it. I got it from BoardGameBliss.com, which is in Canada. So it's Get On Board, New York and London. Oh yeah, let me read the information. Oh, I didn't read the information for Heist, so actually... Well, it's okay. I'll just put it in the comments below. Um, so get on board. Um, this is a 2022 game for two to five players designed by Sashi and the art is by Monsieur Z and the publisher is Yellow Games. Um, I was told by someone who actually works for Yellow that it's pronounced yellow, not I yellow. So this is a network and route building game. Um, so basically you are going to, depending on player count, that will determine which side of the board you use. Um, so if you are two to three players, you're going to use New York. And then if you are three to four or four to five players, sorry, you will use London. They made London look like a grid and London is definitely not a grid. Like I've lived in London. London doesn't look like this. <laughs> like, you know, London most definitely is not a grid. So, but I guess they had to make it like that for ease of play. But it's still cool to see like different landmarks and stuff on the board. Um, and these are the player sheets. I, you know, my biggest gripe for these player sheets is they should have made use of the extra spaces and enlarged these areas a bit because I did scan, not scan, sorry, I did laminate some of these sheets, but I need to get super duper fine point wet erase markers because otherwise it's really hard to use them because there are these like, I don't know if you can see it, but there are these like really tiny boxes that you even need to write numbers in. Not this box, but the tiny, tiny ones next to it. And you actually need to be able to write numbers in those. Uh, so basically it's a game where you are going to have a starting point on this map and that is from where you will be going. Each person has their own personal objective card with a route that they're trying to meet, create, um, and you will have these ticket cards that reveal which so every time a ticket card is revealed it's going to be a certain color you're going to at that point ignore the number and you're going to look at the top of your own sheet and then just put a uh, cross off one of the colors so each color will come up twice and it will tell you on your own player sheet which shape you can make and how many turns you have to have if you choose not to use that many turns or you need a turn but you don't have any then you can cross off at the top of your sheet this but it'll be worth negative points and if you end up in a traffic jam you cross off these buses and the more traffic jams you get into that'll be worth negative points you can never backtrack an area that you have already been in so you can't even be in the same intersection as you were before so basically you're picking up passengers and some of them will give you bonuses and you're trying to get certain passengers to maybe different locations um, but yeah, that's essentially it, you know, without going into too much detail. It's a nice little roll and write, flip and write game rather. Um, so I just wish it had a solo mode because this is the kind of game I would want to play solo. Um, and I'm not sure how often other people would want to play this kind of game. It kind of reminded me a lot of um, uh, On the Underground, London versus and Slash Berlin, which is published by uh, Ludi Creations, the same publisher as that one game that I really like, the Cabbage, um, Mr. Cabbage Heads Garden. Um, but yeah, it reminded me a lot of that actually. But yeah, it's a good game. I really like it. So I'm glad I bought it. Um, and I hope that I'll get a four player game in someday, which I think will be hard for like, a, like, you know, a simple flip and write game like this, but I would really like to try the London map at some point. So yeah, I'm sorry, a traffic jam is when you have to go on a road that is black in color already on the map, which the New York one side does have. 
um, but that's for a lower player account, so I think they want to prevent provide some challenges for players. Or if you go and put down a road where someone else already has a road, so that would also be a traffic jam. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a solid flip and right game, so I do recommend it. Um, the next game I will talk about is a game I do not have in my possession, but I'll talk about it now. It's Gaia Project. So for the first time ever, I played Gaia Project this past weekend. So Gaia Project is a 2017 game, and it's basically Terra Mystica in space. <laughs> so it's for one to four players, designed by Jens Drogmuller, Drogmuller, I don't know, Helge Ostertag, and the artist is Dennis Lahausen, and it's published by Fjordland Spiel. I guess, in Capstone Games maybe, uh, it looks like. Um, so yeah, so this is like a territory building space exploration game with like different kinds of, you know, bonuses and contracts and stuff like that. So there's a lot going on in this game. Um, you know, it's an older game, so I won't go into too much detail, and especially since there's a lot going on, I really wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> but, but when I played it, so they gave me the option of handing out the factions to each player. So I did that based on who I felt each player resembled. So I handed out factions based on resemblance to the different faction leaders. <laughs> um, you know, it could have been like feature wise, or it could have been what they were wearing, like the colors and stuff like that. Um, and I gave myself the one that begins with an L or something like that. I don't even remember what her name was and she's it was blue in color. It's a good game. I uh, it took me a while to figure out what I was doing, but throughout the game I, you know, my um opponent who is very experienced in the game would kind of give me suggestions or tips because it was my first time playing. But, you know, I still think that I'll, you know, my score was due mostly to myself <laughs> so so I scored 100 in my first game I came in last place though but um in a three-player game but I, I think it's a good score for a first time game of, of Gaia Project but yeah like I started to really understand what I was doing like about like halfway through maybe maybe a little bit before halfway through um but yeah you're just basically exploring my special faction ability was nice that and that I could explore and place the smallest building type on other tiles in which people had already explored, which would allow me to explore further and further. So I was actually able to form two federations in my game, um, but you know, I still didn't win. So <laughs> in the end, I was, a, I was, I felt like I was just one resource short all the time of something big that I wanted to do. If I just had one more resource of something, I think I could have you know, edged out a win, but oh well. Um, but yeah, it's a good game. So, you know, it's a it's an older game, but a, a good game. And I would totally play it again, for sure, if someone else brought it out. I don't think I'll add it to my own collection, of course, because I already have enough games, but I enjoyed my play of it. Um, the next game I will talk about is Wizard. I don't even know if it's on Board Game Geek. It's like a trick-taking game. Let's see if I can even find it. There's like a billion games called Wizard. So this was like a game that just used a regular card, um, deck of cards, and I don't think I'll be able to find it, but it was a game that used like a regular deck of cards with a couple cards thrown in, and it was just a trick-taking game, but I don't think I can find it. So I don't think it's actually worth talking about because I just keep on, yeah, every single wizard I click on, and there's quite a few wizards in Board Again Geek, and none of them are this trick-taking game. So I don't even know where my friend got it from, but yeah, um, just a trick-taking game called Wizard with a regular deck of cards with also two extra kinds of characters thrown thrown in, which was a wizard, of course, and then a jester, if I remember correctly. I think those were the extra characters thrown in. But it was a good trick-taking game. It was played over 10 rounds and it had auction in it. Um, not auction, sorry. It had betting in it. So it had betting in it in which you would bet how many tricks you're going to win in a certain round. And then based on whether you actually got your bet or not, you would either gain or lose points. It was really good. I, I enjoyed it. It's a, you know, it reminded me a little bit of Palm Island, which is a trick taking game I had um, reviewed months ago now. I think, you know, that was on Kickstarter. That was the trick taking game that also had um, bidding in it as well, like betting and bidding. So yeah. Um, so moving on, 
The next game I will talk about, okay, this one I'll skip for now. Well, I'll just briefly discuss it, is the search for Planet X, which is like, I think, you know, my number one deduction game. So this was the first time I ever played it in expert mode. And oh my God, expert mode is hard. I've only ever played in standard mode before. Um, and I've, in all the games I've played in standard mode, I've always discovered where Planet X is. And I think I've even won a couple of games because this is a game that I enjoy because the first person to discover Planet X is not necessarily the winner of the game because you also get points for the different theories you put forward and have correct. Um, but expert mode, oh my God, was so hard and I lost pretty badly. <laughs> so yeah, and I didn't even discover where Planet X was. I was one sector off, but yeah. So I played that in expert mode and I would like to try it in expert mode again. Um, admittedly, it'd been a while since I'd played it. So I was a little bit rusty on some of the things, but I started getting it more into it as we were, as the game was progressing. Another game I played, which I'm not gonna talk about in too much detail, is Secret Hitler. We played a nine player game of it. You know, it's an oldie, but a goodie for our game group, though we hadn't played it in a long time, but we had a good turnout at game night the other night. We had nine players, so we were able to play like a nine player game of Secret Hitler, which was fun. So, you know, it reminded me of old times pre-pandemic. And one of the people in our game group is actually German. So we actually asked him, how you know whether his group has ever played secret hitler in germany before and what that's like <laughs> so he actually said that because you know they're german and they would not want to be sitting in like a public place yelling out hitler you're hitler so they actually changed hitler's name to trump so when they would play the game they would say you're trump instead of saying you're hitler because who wants to yell out you're hitler in germany or anywhere to be honest i guess <laughs> so so yeah so that was um a game we played and it was fun um the next game we'll talk about is Picture Perfect. So I'd mentioned this game before, but at that time I didn't have it with me to talk about, but I finally was able to play this game. And one of the recent additions to my collection was the five to six player expansion for this game, which I purchased for, from Board Game Bliss. So let me just bring up the information for Picture Perfect. So this is a 2020 game. It's for two to four players, or if you have the expansion, up to six players. Designed by Anthony Novo, and the art is done by Ronnie Libor, Soren Medding, Gyula Pojge, and Maha Zorsek. Pretty sure I butcher that. And it's published by Corex Games and Arcane Wonders. So in this game, you are like trying to, and they rec they actually say that you actually have to use your phone in the end to take a picture, but you are basically, it's like kind of like a, um, I would say a deduction game. It is a deduction game, kind of. Mm -hmm. Kind of. So like you are going to have um, these envelopes and inside the envelopes there's going to be a bunch of different cards so let me just show you so there's different each character has envelopes so each character will have its own envelope and yes there's a plant character <laughs> so in a dog and a kid whatever and each each person has their own set of standees so you're going to actually have these like plastic things you're going to put these in standees and you are going to have your own table so you are going to have a floor and you can decide which floor you want and you'll have your own screen behind it so it's going to look like this well much nicer of course and you're going to have the table where this big part is and you are trying to position people around the table in these like little boxes according to where they want to go so at the beginning of the game you're going to take a bunch of the placement cards and shuffle them up and put them into the envelopes randomly and i will just read some examples of these placement cards so you can get an idea of where people might want to be so for example one envelope might want to say and you can have contradicting things in each envelope so one envelope might say i want to stand next to this guy or if he is that guy be that guy and it could say i want to stand on the left side of the table but also they also want to stand at the table. So in this case, these are not contradictory because you can actually put the person then 
in one of those two spots since that would be on the left side of the table but at the table so that would limit that person to two spots but sometimes you have completely contradictory cards where it says i want to stand on the left side and then it says i want to stand on the right side or it says i want to stand next to this character or then it says i don't want to stand next to this character because these are randomly just you know shuffled and then put into the cards and there's going to be three cards in each card so you are trying to each person depending on the player account i believe but i think everyone just starts the game with two envelopes and then you are going to take time arranging the standees behind your player screen and then you the active player is going to draw a card which will tell you how if at all you will be exchanging envelopes or revealing new envelopes and that's going to happen for five rounds I believe and then at the end of five rounds you will score and there's also going to be VIP cards each player has a VIP card which means if you believe at some point during the game and you definitely want to do this with a character for whom you believe you have met all three card requirements you can stick a VIP card in that envelope secretly before you know showing that you you're done using that envelope to everyone else and then at scoring that envelope will be worth extra points so the way scoring works is you're going to reveal each envelope and then based on how many card requirements of that character you met you'll either gain points or gain nothing at all if you didn't place that character but if you did place a character but you did not meet a single card you'll get minus three points and again if there was a vip card that could mean more negative points or it could mean more positive points for you and then of course whoever has the most points will win we did not play with the um the different things that actually go on the table so there are some smaller components like um food items and drinks we did not play with those and i've actually never played with playing played i've never played with those so i actually don't know how they work um yet but i've played this game twice now and i like it the people i played with did not like it <laughs> all of them said that they would not play this game again i mean i guess they, they said that they would play it again but they would definitely would not add it to their collection i don't know why because i actually liked it the first time i played it which is why i did want to add it to my collection i thought it was fun trying to rearrange the characters and trying to get them in the most optimal position in order to get the points that you want i thought it was a fun game and at the end of the game you're asked to take a picture of the image and then use that image in order to score because some of the characters say i I don't want this person's face to be seen so in your picture you're going to see if the picture you took you can actually see that face or not and that will determine how you score that character but again i thought you know i think it's a good game and that's why i bought the five to six player expansion for it <laughs> but um but yeah the people i played with were not huge fans of this game i don't know oh well you know different people like different games but i like it so i'm glad it's in my collection but if you've played it tell me what you think and yeah so that was another game i played and then finally i think the last game yep the last game on the list is acropolis which is also a game i've talked about before um so let me just bring up the information for acropolis acropolis so this is a 2022 game um it's for two to four players designed by jules massad and the artist is pauline detraz and it's published by gigamic games gigamic i would never know how to pronounce their name gigamic or gigamic i think it's gigamic i would guess gigamic okay so this is a tile placement game a city building game and i really like this game i really 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 like it um because it's got such basic simple actions but the scoring can really like you know you can really like amplify the scoring based on how you place your tiles um so each player is going to have a starting tile with a plaza in the center and the plazas have stars on them and then you know depending on the player count you're going to have different piles sets of tiles upside down and you're going to reveal a set in the center in the marketplace and that's basically going to be the market and each player starts with a certain number of stones based on their player count uh their player place like if they're first player second player whatever 
and you are going to reveal the tiles in a line and to get the first tile of course is free but then for each subsequent tile you need to place a stone on each tile if you want one that's further down the line so you are trying to strategically place tiles so you you know each tile has different placement rules so blues are um civil like those are like villages, houses. So you will score points at the end for your largest contiguous group of blues. Yellows are markets and they want to be isolated, so not next to any markets. Reds are military and they want to be on the edge of your city. Purples are, um, those are like religious uh, temples where, here's purple and they want to be completely surrounded by tiles and then finally greens have no restrictions greens are gardens but so you can every time you place a tile you can also start to build up if you cover a stone tile you will get that many stones so for each stone tile for each stone hex covered up you'll get one stone but of course you can't cover up one tile completely like this if you cover up a tile it always has to be other tile like made up of at least two other tiles that you're covering up you know what I mean <laughs> maybe maybe you need to cover up three I don't know if you can just do two oh you could probably do two yeah so you need to cover up at least two other tiles when you're covering up tiles um you know you can cover up other stuff it doesn't have to be a stone quarry um, but of course if you want stones that's good because that will allow you to get tiles in the line that you want and it'll also be worth points at the end of the game and they also count as tiebreakers so scoring is interesting so you will only score for the districts for which you have plazas so each like for example here's a plaza for green so you're going to multiply the number of stars you have in total and your plazas don't need to be next to the tiles for which they are going to multiply so like if i had this green tile here but the plaza here that's fine i can still take the individual values of all my greens multiply by the number of stars i have and get my point value so if you don't have a certain plaza for something and you have tiles for that you're not going to score so if i have like purple tiles but no purple plaza i'm going to get zero points for that so you definitely want plazas for the tiles you intend to score and the last game we played um one person so I, I want to read you the scores because they're quite spread out <laughs> so um the lowest score was 64 then there was me with 85 points then another player with 106 points and then the winner had 168 points the reason they had 168 points is because you can build up so you can create different levels so if you're on level one a tile is the base value is going to be one point if you're on level two it's going to be two points if you're on level three it's going to be three points so he had a lot of plazas for the green and he had a lot of gardens which scored him mega points so for his gardens, he had um, 12 stars, so a lot of plazas, and 10 points, which scored him 120 points. That alone was larger than all of our scores, like our total scores. So just for his gardens alone, he scored mega points which was crazy. So he really knew how to play the game and he'd never played before. And it was my second time playing and I performed the worst. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's a really cool game. I really like it. I just, you know, I'm determined to get better at it, um, but I like how simple it is and how the rules are just so simple, but it really comes down to scoring and, you know, placing your tile strategically and then scoring in the end. It's just, I really, really enjoyed it. So yeah, I think it's a really good game and I highly recommend it. So that was the next game I played. The last game. So that is the last game I have played in the last week. So moving on. I actually do have other stuff to talk about in terms of games that I am backing and stuff. So um, let's move on to games that I am backing. So I'm backing two games. I actually canceled my pledge for Weavlings in the Wild. And the reason I did that is because in the last video I talked about like uh, when I said why I was backing it, I was like, oh yeah, I don't know anything about the gameplay, but the artwork looks cool and it's only $20. But then I realized that's how I ended up in my mess before with like a bunch of games that I didn't want that I didn't really 
like wasn't super excited about and I just convinced myself oh it's $20 here it's $30 here but then you know those amounts add up so then I realized like when two games recently came on Kickstarter that I actually wanted I realized like why am I spending $20 plus shipping on a game that I'm not that excited about just because the artwork kind of appeals to me so I cancelled my pledge for Weavelings in the Wild and the campaign for that ended anyway so the two games I'm now backing are called Mind Your Business and leaf. So mind your business is you can buy two boxes of this game if you want to make it a four player game otherwise a three or four player game otherwise one box can be for one to two players. So it's got cool gnomes and stuff in it and you're just like basically exploring mines and just trying to get the most points so it's described as a quick and tricky spatial puzzle that encourages clever planning and pattern recognition while being sparkly sparkly <laughs> but it's got cool gnomes in it and stuff i really like the artwork i really like you know i like spatial puzzle games so i do think i'll enjoy this game and it's not you know terribly expensive so for two boxes it's 38 dollars plus shipping so i'm backing it at the two boxes um, level so that i can get all four gnomes and hopefully play it at three or four players um, so yeah, but if you only do back it at one box, you can get you can choose which color gnomes you want. So you can get either purple and red or blue and yellow. And the other game I'm backing is called Leaf, which I'm super excited about. So Leaf is designed by the same designer who designed Canopy. Um, which I wasn't that into. I had a bit of trouble maybe understanding the rules. I think the rule book just wasn't working for me so I need to go back and play that game again. But Leaf looks really amazing. As someone who is obsessed with Autumn, I just could not resist this game. So it's currently on Kickstarter. It's already at $58,932. Um, and it's got 21 days to go and I'm backing it at the deluxe level because I wanted the wooden leaves. Um, but yeah, it's just got incredible, beautiful artwork. I just love the animal artwork. It's just very autumnal. I just really love it. I'm just obsessed with Autumn, so I'm super excited for this game. So yeah, the deluxe edition is really expensive. Um, for you know the size of the box, I think it's a pretty expensive game. So it's $65, but he always tries to go for um, sustainable packaging and all of that. So you know, he tries to make his games like eco-friendly as, as eco-friendly as possible from what I've read. So yeah, so Leaf looks really good. So I just really adore the artwork and the concept of this game. So I'm super excited about that. So those are the two games I'm actually backing now. So Mind Your Business and Leaf. Um, so let's go into games that I received. So I already discussed Dreadful Meadows. I've discussed Get On Board. And in that same, um, actually in the same order as Get On Board and the expansion to Picture Perfect, I bought Broom Service, the card game. Um, just because, you know, I love Halloween and I have the board game Broom Service, which I really, really love. And I even have the original game, which Broom Service is based on, which is Brew, which I really love. So I thought I would get the card game. Um, so again, I ordered this from uh, Board Game Bliss. So it's not a review copy. So I ordered it along with Get On Board and the Picture Perfect expansion. I was disappointed when I opened the box and saw how small the cards are because like, if the game is just a card game and all you're doing is playing with cards, like I was hoping for standard sized cards. Instead, it's a box with a bunch of like small cards in it. So that was disappointing. I'm like, you know, when you're playing an actual card game, I would prefer to have regular sized cards. I know that's just maybe just a minor gripe, but it's a gripe nonetheless. <laughs> so I haven't played it yet. It's not got the best of reviews, but it doesn't seem like it's terrible. So I thought it might be a fun game to play around Halloween. I haven't played it yet, and I'm also not a fan of this box, like these small cards. Like, I don't know if it required a big box like this, and there's they don't exactly fit that nicely into here. So I got to figure out like a nice solution for this box or maybe not maybe it doesn't actually matter because I spend too much money just trying to come up with solutions for packaging and stuff like that for games that I maybe play like twice so I probably should stop doing that too <laughs> so so yeah so I bought this and that arrived and like I said I already discussed the other games that arrived already when I talked about them so yeah so that is the only addition I have right now 
And I guess that's it. I did not get any questions from anyone, um, but as tomorrow is October 1st and it's like one of my favorite months because I feel like October is like, you know, perfect fall weather usually unless you're in upstate New York and it does start snowing sometimes in October, but that did not happen last year. So fingers crossed that we get a beautiful autumn this year as well. Um, but so I guess I just want to ask you a non-board gaming related question. What's your favorite fall activity? So I'm going to go to the Apple Festival, which is like a local festival this weekend with like lots of fall flavored treats like, you know, vendors and stuff. And then I'm also going to do my most favorite thing ever which is a corn maze or a maze maze um, so yeah so I'm doing a corn maze there's a really good one located about like half an hour away from where I live and the maze is always split up into two parts the first part is supposed to be like the easy part and the second part is supposed to be the harder part um, I really love it um, even the easy part is not that easy um, it's a really good maze and it usually takes at least an hour to complete the whole thing minimum um love it just corn mazes are my favorite fall activity ever so every year i have to do a corn maze so please tell me what your favorite autumn activity activity is so i guess that's it so until oh and if you have any questions or comments below you know leave them below as always um, if you have questions or comments about dreadful meadows or any of the other games discussed please let me know and leave those in the comments below so until next time bye